got it. Well, Rebecca, would you like me to start? Or did, um... Yep, you can go. You can go ahead. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for for inviting me. This is really a privilege, and I always enjoy being uh, at Anderson today. Unfortunately, I had to stay in Houston, but I I love I love the uh, the new building. When I went to Anderson, I was at the old building, and so it's so neat to see this awesome room that you guys get to enjoy, and of course, always the the nice lunch. It's always a good thing to have. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for for having me. And uh, let me just go ahead and I'll start sharing my screen and just make sure that I have it in the right place. Okay, perfect. So um, so. When I was asked by Rebecca to speak to to this group, she said, you know, why don't you come in and talk about your career, just basically my professional career and kind of what I've done. I I thought at first, well, I really don't want to just talk about myself. It's not that exciting to me. But but what was really, really uh, important was really kind of to see what it was that got me to where I am and that it wasn't there from the beginning but I think it was there and it is there now in the way that I that I approach things and so I kind of gather all the experiences that I've had and and you know how how people places education have influenced my career and so I thought about purpose is like you know if I think about purpose what is purpose? You know, um, and I have this definition I wanted to kind of read to you. And um, and it's really interesting because, um, you know, this is from the CEO of Best Buy. And he says, pursuing a purpose as a company means arriving at a clear understanding of what you were put on this planet to do. It helps you steer in the right direction, navigate trade-offs, and when connected to a social or personal purpose, it can inspire remarkable performance. So the part that really that really caught my attention is the, um, you know, the connected to a social personal purpose. And I, I really think that whenever I've talked to the people that have worked with me at companies, it's when there's a connection between what that the company does and what you want to do, what your purpose is. Is really kind of where it's it, it becomes. That's when it, it gives you a lot more satisfaction. So you know it's it's really the purpose gives you direction and meaning. So even when we're in 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 college or even in later years when you're wanting to change careers, right? It's it's like what do what do I want to do and how do I want to grow up and how do I make that decision, right? So the big the big question really to me was like how do I know how did I really know what was next for me every time that I that I moved from one place to another and um and so the one thing too is like it requires a decision right and so that decision I remember my grandpa when I was when I was young he uh, he used to tell me when you make a decision you gain something but you give something else up so you gain you gain friends, you gain a new city, you gain a new, a new, uh, a new job, a new salary, um, a new place, but then you give up some of the things that you were familiar with, the things that you liked and made you comfortable. And now there's a challenge. So I kind of wanted wanted to just sort of frame that, be the frame for for kind of our conversation today and I would love to kind of hear from from you guys if possible. So 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 as we go through here's like I I came up with a with an answer to that but one formula that I found was really interesting and I'm going to share with you in the next page is like how do you, so how do you find purpose right how do you know where you're supposed to be? And so um, the first element, and this is four elements. So the first one is that you love it, right? 
I remember when I was young, I used to love dancing. I used to love, well, I still do. I love dancing. I love singing. And so, you know, I I could be on Broadway and I could just be a, a star. And so that was like pretty cool. And then the second element is you're great at it, right? How do you really know you're great at it, right? So you you just compare, somebody gives you a score or something. So I knew I love singing, but I wasn't great at it. I loved music so much that I really didn't do it. You know, like if I saw myself like on Broadway or something, my voice really wasn't like that. It didn't carry the way that I like some of my most favorite singers to be. Um, and then the third element is the world needs it, right? What does the world need? Like, if you look at it, what is the demand? And, you know, if you think about your economics, supply and demand, what does the world need? Is there a lot of need in the world for it? Um, right. And so the world didn't really need somebody. I didn't have a great voice like what was mine. Right. But I, um, but I started thinking, you know, when I was, um, when I was growing up and I started learning about business and, um, and, and I'll kind of take you to some of those things. Then I started kind of discovering what that was. And because we're in the business school, the four element is you are paid for it, right? Um, there is a lot of nonprofit good causes that might be might be what you end up doing in the end. But I think this four elements is you love it, you're great at it, the world needs it, and you are paid for it. And it doesn't matter what it is, as long as what you get paid for it is, it allows you to have a living, right? It's it's um, it's important to do that. And th this doesn't necessarily mean that it's magic, but it's a formula that has worked for me. So um, especially in the ladies, yeah, at the beginning, I didn't have it. And um, so I just kind of want to share my my journey, uh, just tell you a little bit about myself and kind of how it all started. So I am from Mexico City. I was born and raised in Mexico City. And um, I'm going to point this here. Um, see, this is me as a baby. Um, and my I, I, that's where my heart is, is in Mexico. I had, you know, I was raised with values and, and a very strong faith. And then uh, life took me, my parents were in the, in the radio industry. Uh, I, I grew up in a, in a family that was in the, in the, in the radio and uh, my parents were moved from Mexico City to Juarez. You got Juarez, uh, you know, pretty close to Albuquerque. So um, this is a photo of me and my brother and my parents in, uh, and Morris, and I have the little Mexico and U.S. flag. So uh, by the time I'm, I was 18 years old, when I moved to Juarez, and I had um, transferred from, I started the university in Mexico City, and then I moved to the university in Juarez. And when I was there, a really good friend of mine, uh, mine told me, you need to go to UTEP. Um, of course, it was before I found out at UNM. So he helped me. I got into UTEP. So then I transferred to UTEP. During that time, I, um, you know, I, I had a chance to, to be, um, because my parents were on the radio, I also participated in a, in a children's television show in Mexico. And so I was kind of on TV on the weekends when I did my, my, my job when I was in college. And then I was going to, to college and it came a time to decide like what I wanted to do, you know, which major I, I had to select. And, um, uh, and I wasn't sure. I loved accounting. My parents uh, were in the in the accounting business, and uh, I'm sorry, my mom did a lot of the accounting. And so one of the things that I always wanted to do was, um, you know, she was super fast with the ten key. You know, she typed so fast, and I always pretended I was fasting typing as fast as she could. And so I I um, thought, you know, it'd be so cool to do that. Um, but then it was like that's something really that I loved. Um, and I wasn't great at it, um, but I've just kind of kept that in mind. Um, the other thing that I thought too is like, well, if I'm going to be uh, in another country, I don't know that that's something that can apply. And do people need it? Yes, everybody needs accountants, right? Um, but I could also go into broadcasting because that's what it, where I was. So life uh, then took me to um, Albuquerque. I got married with a with a with my uh, my college sweetheart and uh, we uh, he got a job at Sandia National Labs and so we moved to New Mexico and so we were in Albuquerque and I transferred again so it was my fourth transfer um college and I 
ended up at um, at UNM, and I didn't know, of course, that uh, you could move, well, you could go to different college, different than where you live. But that's kind of how the life happened for me. And so UNM was just fantastic for me. Um, but uh, but one of the things that I thought, and and I'm just kind of gonna share. Um, let me see if I can get it here. Um, when I was trying to decide, like. I was scared. And this is what my mornings look like when I was in Juarez going to UTEP. Every morning I'd go across the border to go to college. And I would just sit there, you know, going to about an inch, an hour. And um, and I'll look at the people going, um, walking across the border and all the cars and and I was scared to death because I didn't speak English. I actually didn't pass the TOEFL. That's the test of English of uh, speakers of uh, foreign languages. But the requirement was at UTEP that I had to take 11 credits of English my first three semesters, which I did. And, and I sat there, I would sit there and I was scared to death and I would just be at the wheel, just thinking, looking at all this. And I'm like, what am I doing? This is crazy. And I... um. And, and you know what kept me going was, um, I'm sure, look at all these people. They probably are, work, are working super hard and probably doing more work than I am. So I'm sure I'm not the first person to do this and probably not going to be the last. So if someone else has done this, I think I can do it. And I work super hard. I, you know, the whole time I, I, I try to make friends with people that wouldn't speak Spanish to me. So I'd learn English. I'd watch the soap operas every day. I knew who like General Hospital, Young and the Restless, all those. I watched them all because that's what my English teacher told me to do. Like she said, that was, um, you know, that was one way to learn English and it worked out. And the second thing I wanted to do, I wanted to not have an accent. But when I got to Texas, I figured it doesn't matter. Everybody has an accent. So, you know, I have to have my own. Um, so I, um, I work in, so this is kind of the picture that I remember from one of the most difficult times in my life. And it was just, you know, trying to do something and decide, is this really what is meant for me? And uh, so anyway, I, I, um, I continued on and, um, and, you know, my life has just been, has, has just been so rewarding. When I was in Albuquerque, then um, I, um when we interviewed, I was a member of the Association of Accounting Students and Beta FSI at the time. I was very active there. And uh, one of the great benefits of being a student was that um, there, one of my friends who actually she was my best friend and we carpooled um, and uh, she hurt her foot and she couldn't walk. Well, she had to wear a boot for about six months and we carpooled. So she got a handicapped decal. So it was fabulous for the six months that I was at Anderson. Um, we got to park front, uh, in the front row. So that was like super cool. And I, I really, I really like, so you never know what's going to happen, right? You have friendships, things happen and you say yes, just kind of saying yes to, to everything has been one thing. It's like, what is the worst that can happen? And just, I go for it. So that was one of the really cool things about that, that I remember it was just had six months of front row parking because I was carpooling with my friend who had hurt her foot. Um, anyway, so uh, while we were there, we, we um, organized the, uh, the help organize the career fair and, you know, we were very active doing things. And that's kind of when I started developing relationships. Uh, one of the, uh, the firms that were there at the time, I was, I became an accounting major, right? And I, and I, I decided that because, you know, it was, it was just something that really Let me just make sure that I am.
anyway, um, hey, Rebecca, I just want to make sure that we're connected. Uh, let me just, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, I don't know. There was sort of like a, um, there was a pop-up message that I was. Yep, uh, you're okay it. now. Okay, perfect. Anyway, so, um, you know, I think that one of the, the, the great things about, about life is just, like I said, I was just like saying yes. And, um, and so I had, a, 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 at the time, the big four accounting firms that were interviewing were Arthur Anderson, KPMG, um, and, and a couple of local firms, and um, got an offer for, from uh, Arthur Anderson at the time, that was uh, one of the big eight firms in accounting, and now there's only four, but um but I, but but what you know the reason as to why did I really decide to go there and it really was there was it was twofold right it was at the end it was just between KPMG and Arthur Anderson and and uh and one of the things that I really liked about Arthur Anderson was that I felt special I know this was like totally silly but I feel special because they didn't give as many offers to students as KPMG did. And I thought, well, if they gave less, that means that I'm more special. Which is totally, you know, silly. But um, but I think, you know, I, I think that there, there are things that we decide sometimes, you know, it's like, what are the trade-offs? But if I think about the elements, it was like, I love it. Yes, I love it. I'm going to get paid. <laughs> The world needs it, obviously, and the auditors, right? It's like the audits are needed. And at the time, and I liked it, right? It was like something that that was going to happen. And so, so when I, I started with Arthur Anderson, and then uh, a few years later, about three years, later, so graduated in '92. That's that's almost 31 years. And um, and so I got a uh, my my husband got a chance to move. He got a job in Houston, and that's when I moved to Houston in '95. And so I had the opportunity to either go with Arthur Anderson, like I was, or go with KPMG because I started some conversations that uh, my friend that went to work for KPMG um, introduced me to some of the partners and I interviewed with them because I had learned financial institutions when I was um, in Albuquerque, but then I really wanted to do something different. And uh, KPMG had at the time what they had, it was called the NAFTA Center, is like the, the North American Free Trade Agreement that now has been replaced by the new the treaty. I can't remember the name of it. So, but anyway, so um, I was very intrigued because the whole time that I was in Albuquerque, I didn't get to do any international work. And because of my background, I mean, I had to, I was from another country. I wanted to do some international work and uh, and KPMG gave me that opportunity. And, um, you know, again, I, I could speak Spanish. I was great at it because very few things spoke, uh, very few people spoke Spanish. And I got opportunities. I got to go to Spain, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica. Uh, one of the partners that was in charge of the Latin America practice for the, the SEC reporting, he was SEC reviewing partner. Um, he got to, uh, you know, teach me and take me with him and all these different projects. And we got to train executives from all these countries because I spoke Spanish. And so that was really kind of how I found, like how I was different. And I just capitalized on it. And I kept trying, of course, work crazy hours, but that's just kind of the way it was. Um, but so, so anyway, so that's kind of, that's how it was at KPMG. And, um, <coughs> and, and then later on, um, you know, I did some work with as, as a CFO. I was a strategic CFO. That was the name of the company. But in between that, it was something that was important to me. And um, I I was, after 10 years of public accounting, it was um, a lot of hard work, um, you know, worked until really late hours in the, in the, um, in the night, traveled a lot, learned a lot. Um, but, um, you know, after those 10 years, I had already had my first two children and I needed some break. I needed a break. I needed to reduce my schedule in terms of hours and what I worked. And I really, um, you know, couldn't make it work. At the time, it wasn't something that we did, um, that the firms did. And, uh, and so it we tried and, and it was, it just didn't work. So, you know, it, it was really kind of 
this is really kind of what kept me going, right? It's my family. And so I felt my purpose wasn't being met because in addition to being a professional, I'm a mom. And so this is how my children are now. Uh, my youngest, Paul, he's 22. Marky is 32. And Stephanie is 24. And, uh, and my husband, Mark. And, and, uh, and so they're an important part of my life. This is who I love being with and I'm being around and I just wanted to be with them, right? And so um, this is this is kind of really what the, the balance on thinking about what your purpose is and how you can be more effective. And so that's kind of where the difficult times came. And, uh, but this was part of, of, of who I am. So going back to where, um, you know, where I was at this point after KPMG, I went to work for this company that's called the Strategic CFO. And we were CFO, uh, would they provide advisory as CFOs for companies, for uh, entrepreneurial companies. And I learned about entrepreneurial skills. It was fantastic. I learned a lot and, uh, and it allowed me to work a, a really reduced schedule where I worked about 20 to 30 hours a week. And so it allowed me to go take my kids to school, pick them up, and maybe spend a little more time than I was in the past because they were always at daycare. So that worked, that was my personal experience and, um, and, and, and I loved it. And then after they got a little older, then I went back to industry. Because I was in Houston, I ended up working with a, a two oil and gas services companies. And, um, and I know this is a really difficult topic and that's kind of what it was in Houston, right? It's like, that's the kind of jobs that are, it's just energy. It's all about energy. And there's a lot that have been, has been done and, um, you know, had some really good conversations with my daughter. Um, but there's a, it's a huge importance to provide energy to the world. And, and this is part of the, part of the, the, the role and the purpose of, of these companies, right? Is to provide energy to the world. And yes, we're in transition and change, things are changing. Um, but currently, there's only about 10 to 15 percent of energy is provided by uh, renewable sources like uh, solar and wind. And the rest, the, the remaining 85 percent is really uh, fossil fuels. And uh, and and so I think that the world is is advancing a lot in the um, in technology to get to where we need to be with renewable resources. In the meantime, a lot of these energy companies that are in the oil and gas fossil sector they're doing tremendous uh, advances in in technology to where the emissions are being reduced and so that's really something that 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 got me that that, that really was in, that has been inspired to me in the last 5 or so years so so what happened here um i i worked for two companies uh were geokinetics and paragon offshore both um oil and gas services their offshore drilling company and uh, and I got to travel the world. I went to all these different places in um, Middle East, uh, Asia, um, South America, Europe, and it was it was just a tremendous experience. And I really felt I was meeting my purpose. The purpose of the company was to provide energy to the world, and mine was to help that happen. My role was small because my role was in accounting. I was chief chief accounting officer at the time. And, and and I was great at it. And of course I got paid for it. It was it was something that I loved. And um, and it and the company was about a mile away from my kids' school at the time. Uh, they were going to high school. And so it was it was great for me. I could just drive down real quick if anything was needed. So that really worked out well for me. Um, and so that I was able to do that. Towards the um, towards the end, this was this was this this was now in 2018. In 2018, when um, the company, uh, because of there were some transactions that were not uh, there were there were a couple of transactions that were due. The company was really highly leveraged. There was a lot of debt that the company had. Oil got, the oil uh, price went down significantly. And so what that did, it just really reduced the cash flow that was available to the company. And so they were unable to pay the debt and service the debt. And so what happened is they had to file for bankruptcy. Um, there was a restructuring. And of course, it was scary. Um, but at the time, I had to really think about what is my purpose and what am I doing here with this team that I am overseeing? And my purpose was at that time, because the company could no longer be liable 
My job was to keep the team together. We had to be with the company. We had to help them. We had to do and keep the books, right? You have to be able to provide the financial information to the investors that were at, at risk, the customers that were at risk, the banks that were at risk, and for whatever the company needed to move forward. So instead of feeling and acting like this is something terrible that happened because the company filed for bankruptcy, we got together with the team and we said, what can we do to build our resume? That was my job at the time. That was my purpose, to help the team align their personal goals, which was to get, to stay with the company we could, and if not, to build their resume to get a better job at the next stage of their life. And so what I did is like, okay, make sure that you, whatever project you want to do, whatever you want to make your job easier, that is going to be a project that's going to be great for you. So let's just say if someone wanted to, you know, they, somebody said, you know, the process in which we are recording these journal entries doesn't make sense. We need to make it more efficient. I said, great. So create a, create a process that you think needs to be there. We create it. We build it, we create the training for everybody else to follow it, and then we deploy it. And so a lot of people were super excited about that, and they were able to put that on their resume. The other thing that as a team, we made a decision about the systems that we had, the information systems were outdated. And so we talked to, to the, I, I had to talk to the leadership of the company, talk to the CEO and the CFO, and I asked them if we could implement this new system and they thought I was crazy. And I said, look, we're spending more time and we're being a lot more inefficient if we don't. But I told the team, if we have this new system, you guys are going to have to work extra hard to get it done. And of course, they they said yes. They said, yes, we're willing to do it. And I got the budget approved. And, uh, and we implemented a new system that was really the reporting system on uh, the accounting and, and the team was, was happy because they were able to be more efficient in, the, in their work. They had to spend less time creating reports and more analyzing the information. And they built the resume. Some of them, most of them actually in the end, probably a couple of years later, they um, found jobs in other companies. And um, and at the end of the of the bankruptcy, I um, I was because I was an officer of the company. All the officers had to leave, and so I had a chance to basically retire early. And so I had time. I had time to to think as to what I wanted to do next. And um, here, let me just jump through here. So I took some time off, and I was just looking at you know. What does God want me to do? I wanted to keep with this company. I wanted to stay with this company for a long time. Well, what's next for me? I wanted to also, you know, said, well, I could be CFO. I could be CEO. Um, but the chances for me of this happening now that this company has, you know, has uh, gone out of business, basically. Um, you know, how do I, what's next? And I just wasn't inspired to go another place and start all over with the same kind of job. And so one of the things too that I learned from, from that company was that the, um, the, the team and the operations were focused on EBITDA. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with EBITDA, um, but basically stands for, in, in case if you're, you're not on the, the finance accounting side, it's earnings before income, uh, income taxes, depreciation and amortization. So basically it's an, it's an earnings measure that doesn't take into consideration depreciation, income taxes, amortization of intangibles. And, uh, and so the, the, the funny thing is that it provides a measure of, of profitability, but it doesn't include the whole picture because depreciation includes the cost of your fixed assets, right? So it's, it gets a little complicated, but basically, in my opinion, um, it was like, why are we focusing on this so much? And it was an undue focus on, on EBITDA. And I think that's part of the reason why there were, there were some issues with the performance of this company, but nobody was going to listen to me. And that's what I thought. Um, so, so even, you know, just to kind of as an anecdote, little quote, um, 
Warren Buffett also kind of agrees with me. He um he also thinks is like um, you know, EBITDA is not necessarily as important as most companies do. And a lot of them, a lot of people might disagree with me, but but uh, but he always says, who's gonna pay for fixed assets, the tooth fairy? Um so so especially in an industry like the offshore drilling industry, you know, a, a rig can cost, you know, anywhere from 20 million to 150 million dollars. And so somebody needs to pay for it. And for companies not to take into consideration depreciation, it's kind of crazy. Anyway, so so after this, I, I thought, you know, what can I do? I I wasn't happy either. The team turned terrible uh, with the other other executives. And and so I thought, you know, what is next? So like, how can you do? I mean, I I, I want to be able to to link purpose and profits, and I want to do it on my own. Um, I want to create something. One of the things that I found too when I was uh, at, on all these companies is that there were a lot of professionals out in the market that didn't want to work full time. A lot of parents, uh, people that didn't want to just work crazy hours. And so the one way that I could attract talent was by hiring people uh, that wanted to work part time. And so a lot of my best uh, team members were those who could not be hired by by some of the larger corporations because everybody just wants to be the same. And so everybody needs to work full time. And so there's it's very hard to have all these flex schedules and things like that. And so. I mean, now it's getting a lot better, especially after COVID. Um, but at the time, it was difficult. And so that was, to me, something that I loved. And I wish I could give that opportunity. Because when I was a young mother, I wish somebody had given me that opportunity to just work in a professional environment where I could do my best, but at the same time, not have to work like 60, 70 hours a week. And so so um, that was one of my passions. That was something in the back of my mind. And that's that's when I um, I decided to to think um, about creating a company, and that's how my the idea of ESG Link started. The name of my company, and uh, and uh, and so I I was able to to seize like okay, um, purpose plus profits equals value, and this is not like a magic formula and something that I came up with, but but um, this was a, a concept that was. Um, that was really emphasized probably in about 2018 or 19, if you guys haven't heard. So the the, the round table is, uh, the business round table is a group of about 120 executives of the biggest uh, companies in the US. And so the CEOs basically got together and they decided, you know, it's like there is in the market a very high emphasis and focus on just the um the profits and not so much about purpose right and so how do purpose of organizations work and so it was an announcement that was done and a lot of people try to po uh, politicize it um but but all these companies said they just were in agreement right and so it's like how i said well because if you link and and you know similar to that uh quote that i put at the beginning is is you know linking that purpose um, and so, you know, the purpose and the profits really are going to generate value. And because it just, it just works, it works. And, um, and so that's kind of how a lot of the organizations have created. And, and you probably have heard about ESG, environmental social governance reporting, because the reporting is to investor, investors doesn't need to just be about, um, about profits, but really take into consideration in addition to the stakeholders who are your uh, your shareholders, you also need to look into your customers, your um, your vendors, your employees, um, and really focus and start measuring it. And, um, and so how ESG Link was created was with that in mind. And so I started doing some research and I found that a lot of companies had sustainability reports, and, and you might be familiar with sustainability reports, which include both uh, environmental, social, and governance disclosures. And so I decided there's, uh, um, but a lot of the process in creating these reports was very inefficient. And so I thought there's a need in the market 
to find the efficiency of SEC reporting, which, which had been my entire life, with the sustainability, right? People want to know what companies are doing for the environment, for the communities, and for the vendors and, and their employees. And so when you combine the discipline of SEC reporting with the with purpose of a company and and and, and other factors, then um, you know we thought that we could add value. And so that's kind of how it starts. So it's a it's a small boutique firm, and uh, and we've been now for almost five years uh, providing services to companies. We have large uh, we have large uh, clients. Uh, Primarily in Houston, some in New York, and and some um, other states, but uh, but it, it it has been great. It, it actually is what kind of helped me having that experience, having the CEO experience that that helped me um, do some board service. So I have been doing some uh, board uh, work. I serve on the board of the California Resources Corporation, um, and let me just kind of go back here. Um, and um, so I serve on the board, I'm on the audit committee. Um, now I'm the audit committee chair of California Resources Corporation. They're a, a public company and they're doing great strides. They're, they do, um, they're an oil and gas company, but they also have a, um, a very advanced uh, in the process of carbon sequestration. So they're really transitioning from being a pure um, oil and gas company into carbon sequestration. And so at the end of the day, um, you know, after after creating, you know, starting ESG Link and, and serving on boards, um, you know, came back to really it's about balance, right? Is is having the 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 ability to to balance your life with uh, you know family, personal interests, and but also it's possible to have uh, you know do good and do well by by being profitable. Um, Anyway, I I think that that's that's what I uh, what I had prepared. I wanted to really kind of learn more about you guys. What what questions you have, Rebecca? If you if you can um, if you can sort of moderate that, see if we can have more questions. Let's see. So, um, Ali, you have one question in the chat. Um, do you serve nonprofits as well? Yes, I have served non nonprofits. Um, and uh, there is, th yes. So the answer, the answer to that is yes. And, and honestly, I, um, I've served in about five different nonprofits. Um, one of them was a, um, a country club, and that's why I kind of, uh, I was kind of uh, laughing about that a little bit. Uh, it was a different experience. Uh, the other one was a a women's organization, a non denominational women's organization. I served on the board of the uh, Anderson Foundation for three years. That was very very rewarding. Um, and then I also served on a uh, women's organization. It's like the uh, Women's Business Enterprise Alliance. Which is an organization that helps promote uh, women's businesses, and um, and 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 to be honest, remember, I mean, we talked about the four elements, right? Um, uh, you're you're great at it, um, you love it, the world needs it, and you get paid for it, and um, and I think that I was good at being on boards of nonprofit organizations. And, uh, but I didn't have as much experience working for nonprofit organizations. I think that my skill sets were in profit and for profit and public companies. I felt more comfortable because that's where I had my experience. And so I think that that was um, that, and, and there's that, that was, that was for me the determining factor. And, you know, other than UNM, because UNM loved it, that was, uh, it, it was just very rewarding. And it's also, is the business school is, is very different. But, but on the other, on the other boards, I think it was just that I felt I didn't have um, the skill set for that type of operations. And, uh, and the other one, the other thing too, you know, on the question, I know here you were asking this question. Um, the that uh, the reporting on the the ESG reporting the sustainability reporting 
is really linking the um, those factors that are either environmental, social, to profitability, right? And those are really kind of hard to see. And is it okay? Let me just, you know, what I'm going to do this, there's actually, let me see if I have a slide here. Um, real quick. Maybe don't. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I have it. So let me share that with you. And, and I, I think it's important for me to kind of share this with you guys, because there is a little bit of misconception in the public. Um, it gets a little bit politicized, um, in the way that, that these, all these factors, um, are important in business. So I just kind of wanted to show you this. And this is an example of those metrics. So for example, um, one of the uh, environmental metrics that are used in these, this type of report is if you see on the left, right? An, an example is the total energy consumed, the percentage of grid electricity, the percentage of renewal electricity, and you know what, this is all in greenhouse gas emissions, right? And so in the business world, it's a little bit hard to kind of get your hands around this concept. So if I'm a retail organization or a manufacturing company, there's a lot of energy that is um, used. So the less energy, the more efficient a company is in terms of energy consumption, the less cost they're going to have, right? The beauty of this is that by using less energy or by using a combination, by using energy that's more efficient in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, whether it could be that they it, they use renewable energy, right? And it's produced in a way that is that lowers, lowers costs. So it's gonna have an environmental benefit because by using less energy, there are less emissions that are released into the atmosphere. So that's the EHG metric. The financial driver for that is operational efficiency, right? Less energy means less costs. And the, so the financial impact, you're going to have lower operating expenses. Your weighted average cost of capital is going to be lower because your risk profile is going to be different. A lot of companies these days, there's financing that's given to companies um, where they have targets to reduce emissions and their interest rate on their borrowings are um, are lower based on those um, um, those threshold and also their their um, their discounted cash flow value models are going to be to where they have a, a higher valuation because of the consequences of this so this is part of um, of how to link Again, it's it's a little bit of that linking purpose and profits, right? It's like I want to do good, I want to um, uh, pollute the environment less, and how is that going to translate? Well, the company is going to decide how to then decide on 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 which of those initiatives on reducing emissions is more important and is going to give you the better economic benefit. And so that's where you have the two where they can be connected. Um, you know, companies can just choose to ignore it, but that's that's usually kind of where the uh, the the uh, the link is and and where there's a lot going on right now in terms of like the business community and the and um, and just really kind of like I said, just linking that purpose and profits and and it can be, you know, for profit or not. We have a question from the room, Ali, um, Alice. Yes. She might be able to hear you, but can you hear me okay? Like this? Yes, I can hear. Um, so I really liked what you said about I liked how you framed your experience working at oil and gas. You know, just going under all about building your resume, I think that's something that we all um, you know, as students really resonate with. And I think we're experiencing a few interesting phenomena. So first, you know, there's a lot of Know that there's some generational shifting now. There's a lot of um, baby boomers who are in 
positions of authority, which is really great. So there's lots of uh, institutional knowledge there. But you know, depending on your industry, you may it might benefit your career or hinder it. And so with that in mind, do you have any advice in terms of negotiating maybe a job or a salary that helps you build your resume? Because I feel like there's, you know, I, I come up to these barriers a lot where, um, you know, you know, you might have a specific skill set or speaking qualities, but you don't quite get that opportunity to demonstrate or take those those learning, you know, operate on that learning edge in a given organization. Is there a way that you have seen people do that well in kind of the, your introduction to a firm? Because um, I feel like that's kind of your, your first impressions. You're able to actually engage in those kind of scarier conversations. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, your name? Alice. Alice, um, Alice I think the uh, it is difficult. Um, but one of the things is that I would say is communicate, right? Communicate, communicate. And if there, I think that what hasn't changed and what's not different is just to build a network um, of people where you work. You know, you need to identify the people that are going to be uh, your mentors. Uh, they're going to be like your cheerleaders and someone that you can go to. And then there's the people that are going to promote you, right? There's sometimes there's those might be the same person, but sometimes they might not be the same person. Um, when you mentioned you mentioned about baby boomers, a lot of them being in positions or of of authority and and you know having to make those decisions, there is. A tremendous amount of awareness today because of this uh, sustainability reporting, the investors are paying attention to, uh, attention to, the CEOs are paying attention to, and there's a great number of initiatives in many companies. I mean, you've heard that all the all the big names, probably like uh, you know Google and Amazon and uh, Disney, some of the big companies that um, have uh, you know have a lot of publicity on giving opportunities to everyone. Um, and so as opposed to kind of what it was in the past, um, one thing that, that I would say is that you do need to speak up. I think that there's a better chance today of being heard that it was in the past. And of course, that's just like, again, it's just my, my view, but, but I really think that there's a better chance today. Um, starting with the HR department, because they know what initiatives are out there. Um, the other one is just to really, uh, you know, because they might, uh, might have like mentorship programs, but someone knows Like you talked about some of the skill sets that you think that you have and people might not know. It's about letting people know that you have them. And if you don't, if they're not at the level that they need to be, then so that you can ask for training to, to be where you need to be. Um, I think that you know, from my personal experience, if you don't have a person or a mentor that is going to be supporting you and helping you all the way, um, it, it is going to be difficult because there's always someone out there that is going to know and is going to be at the table whenever they're talking about what your skill sets are, what your, you know, whatever your, um, your goals are. And um, I, I can, let me see, I, I think that, you know, there, there was, I think there was an instance where I, uh, I was in a situation where I wasn't even going to be listened to. <laughs> I knew that the person that was in charge didn't even want to, didn't even want to meet with me. And if you have a situation like that, then you need to identify and whether you can stay at that company or not. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think um, that was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> can, Ali, can I add? I think I think the network thing is is so important. I think everyone in the room recognizes that. But I would also say um, to Alice's point, like 
I mean, Alice is, Alice is going to go out and do great things, but remember to turn around and offer your hand to the next person that comes behind you, because exactly. just remember um, that you're going to, you're going to use somebody's hand to help you get there. Remember to turn around and offer yours um, to the person that's coming behind you. I, I've also yeah. heard that in mentor mentee relationships. Yes. Sometimes that's mm -hmm. that role is your person. Yeah. Kind of relationship. And and nice also, Ali, that you differentiated mentor versus cheerleader. Yeah. That's, that's a very um, wise uh, statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and and it's kind of funny, but um, what especially when I was looking for a board position a corporate board which is a lot more difficult to get um and I heard it from someone and it was so true that my mentors knew my weaknesses they knew what I needed to work on and they saw me as someone that was below their level and it's kind of hard to to get that out of someone's way of thinking right it's really hard to change how someone views you and so when I was actually looking for a board role, this, I was more successful with the people that didn't know me that well, but I, but I built those relationships because they knew me as the person that had already worked through whatever my challenges were. And so it's almost like your mentor is going to have an end to what your weak spots are and may be thinking too much about them versus someone that doesn't know you. And I, and anyway, so that was, that was kind of part of that too. When I was telling you, you know, maybe your cheerleader doesn't know you. So doesn't know all your weaknesses, let's say. Um, but, but I think that that's, uh, that was, that was so true. And sometimes we think that because they know all our weaknesses and our strengths, that they're going to be the ones that are going to be cheering for us, but that might not be the case. That sounds like the perfect encapsulation of like how your family views you, you know, like they see you in your kid, and all your stupid mistakes, and then you enter into the workforce and you have an ability to not refine yourself, but highlight the pieces that are applicable to the goals that you're pursuing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and prejudice is always going to be, we all have them, right. And it's with, you know, and most, the worst one is the unconscious one, right. Because we don't realize that we have them But uh, Yeah. Kind of getting around, around that. I, um, and, and I, anyway, yeah, I had, a, I had an instance where it was, um, you know, there was a, a situation, it was a difficult situation for me professionally because I wasn't given the opportunity for a new role. And, uh, and, a few years later, I had the chance to talk to one of the board members and I asked him, um, you know, I said, I know it's been a long time. This doesn't exist anymore. And I was just curious, did it have anything to do with the fact that I was a woman? And he said, he didn't hurt you, but he didn't help you. And that was, I guess, the safe response. Um, but, you know, it's like you say, there's a lot of boomers, especially in the oil and gas business where you have, you know, a whole bunch of guys that like to do things together. And, and you know, and, and it could be the same thing if there's a bunch of women that have a company like mine and um, that, you know, you just have things in common. It, it happens. It's unconscious. And it just um, anyway, uh, it's a reality. And, and I'm so glad that there's a lot of uh, a lot of awareness today because it is so it's so um public now in the past i don't think that people knew about it and today i think that you know even the laws are starting to change to where you know you can't have uh non-disclosure agreements anymore especially if some of those things are are happening say too much <laughs> i have a question yes uh okay so my question is did you choose your mentors or did they ask you how did that happen? Um, I think it was, I think I did, you know, at the end of the day, I think I did because, um, uh, I mean, they, they naturally, they naturally happen once you start establishing a relationship, right? I think it probably starts with just being a relationship first with the people that were, that I worked for. Um, 
that were natural. And so the way to do it, and actually uh, there's this book that's called Never Eat Alone, right? But so you have lunch, you have occasions and and uh, where you have opportunities to have a conversation and share challenges. And, uh, and so I think that it, because it takes action of actually setting time right so you know reaching out to whoever your supervisor is or your friend is is reaching out and say hey do you want to go to lunch do you want to you know or just pick them depending on the relationship right you pick up the phone and have a conversation so it's um it's i would say the majority of the case it's going to be you pick them um there are other times where uh there are, um, you know, people that just feel, you know, inspired and they do that, but it's harder for someone to, uh, to choose you than cho- you choose them. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And by the way, you all can call me anytime. I think I have, I'll put my, um, I have, do I have my contact information there? Like your cell phone? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> all right. Put it on the chat. Is that chat? Yeah. Um, you just have to tell. You just have to send me a text first and say, "Hey, I'm a." Because sometimes he might say, you know, like spam or a note or whatever. <laughs> Especially so, coming from the Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling from Anderson. Oh, okay, okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> Any other questions? I have Oh, uh, did you do internships? Because you talked about jobs that you had, but I didn't hear anything about being an intern and building your skills or no. getting paid. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's a great question. I was, you know, this is funny, but um, my junior year, I it was a bad time. It was 1991, and the uh, it was the 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 Cold War, and it was the the economy wasn't good. So when I I was a junior, I interviewed for an internship, and uh, KPMG was the only company that was having internships, and then they ended up not hiring anyone that year, and so I didn't have one. Um, but if you have an opportunity to do that, that'd be great. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you too is that I don't know, um, you know, I'm sure through the Career Center, um, <coughs> have all the opportunities there. But you know, going to another state or another city is usually another another way to do that through internship. No, I wish I had an internship, but I didn't. I really kind of worked um, when I did. It wasn't a, a formal internship. I did, uh, you know, jobs that I found, and of course with my family that helped a lot. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have another question more about kind of the broader ESG landscape in general. Um, I'm working on a presentation for corporate finance costs, and I just spent like eight hours going through like webinar videos, blah, blah, blah. So um, what are, like, is your product something that's going to have to adapt to the IFSR series one and two that are going to be released? Or like, how how are these global changes going to impact your firm? Um, it's actually, it's a great opportunity for us because the way that we started was um, with that in mind, right? That eventually that would be because the basis of the new international accounting standards on sustainability, just in case the other ones, in case everyone else is not familiar. The basis for that is two frameworks and standards, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board or SASB and the TCFD, which is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. So those two are primarily the basis for the new international accounting standards. And we started with uh, SASB's uh, standards were issued. It was, it was, you know, it's the U.S. entity was issued in 2018 when it, when I started, and I had my um, my credential that was issued by the SASB, which is the Fundamentals of Sustainability Accounting. So I got my credential because I knew that the focus was going to be um, um, on the investors, right? The investors' materiality. Um, so I, 
I think right now we're getting a lot of calls and a lot of opportunities because basically we're just the our clients that were already reporting under SASB and TCFD are basically all prepared and ready for whenever the the standards come out, you know, when they become mandatory for the international financial reporting standards and also because the the uh, the new SEC rules are coming out in April for the climate disclosures um, on public companies in the US. And so all those are aligned. And so that's gonna really be um, a great opportunity. And so we're kind of really looking forward to it. Our challenge is gonna be scaling. Follow-up question to that. Would you be interested in maybe calling our finance chair and being like, hey, this is a big need. You should update our curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I didn't hear the part about exactly what I needed to do. Oh, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, oh I was just, I was being a little coy and I was asking. <laughs> like, our... so you have my phone number. <laughs> so we can talk about that. So I understand what we need to do. I love to to do, um, you know, whatever I can. Obviously, there's, you know, some time limitations, but I'd love to, if there's anything that I can do to kind of help with that, I, I'd love to do that. We've, um, you know, just like I said, just love love this school and and be happy to do, help you guys. Well, thank you so much, Ali. We really appreciate your time today um, and um, your advice and experiences is, is so valuable for for everyone here. So um, we can't thank you enough. Um, and yeah, so well, thank thanks, you so much. Thanks for giving back to your alma mater. We really appreciate it. So, thank you. Um, have a great rest of your day, and um, I'll be in touch. You too. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks, thank Allie. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.